Okay, that coming through okay? So yeah, that? that's perfect. Brilliant. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the invite. Um, so um, I said initial apologies to uh, to Flavio and some of the other my other colleagues on this call who will have seen this talk in a very similar form before. Um, I, it's been great actually to be able to listen to Flavio and also Eli beforehand giving some really interesting insights and very interested in having follow up discussions about those after this. Um, so I'm sort of going to take give sort of the perspective as an epidemiologist really starting to scratch the surface and think about um, incorporating economic harms into this ep these epidemiological models. I'm going to say this right at the start, there is a long way to go with this work. We are very much scratching the surface. We've started to think about this problem, but I'm really interested in any collaborations going forward to try and drive this work on. So say that right at the start, but um, I'm going to just um, introduce some of the work that we have been doing. Um, and um, probably a lot of you may be aware of the Warwick um, deterministic um, compartmental model that has been used quite widely for the last almost two years now to look at the spread of COVID infection in the UK. Um, it's been used for a number of different things, um, including the roadmap modelling to come out of the current lockdown um, and various different aspects of disease control and predictions over the last sort of 18 months or so. Um, I'm going to start off with the model framework. So um, this is really a schematic of what the model looks like. As I said, it's age structured, it's deterministic, um, and um, individuals will start off as susceptible. And then when they become infected, okay. they will become exposed. Um, and then we assume that in individuals will either become detectable, i.e. they will have symptoms and they will be reported as infected, or they may be asymptomatic or have only mild symptoms and do not report infection and therefore undetectable. And of course, of those detectable individuals, the number will go to hospital, go to intensive care units or sadly die from the disease. Now, um, all of these transition rates that you can see, you'll see these subscript A's and subscript B's on here. This is because age is a driver in risk. So we have age specific parameters that um, underlie this infection process. So um, what we do as well in this model is we count for household effects. So the first infection that comes into the household is considered separately from subsequent infections, because of course, once you have an active infection in the household, it's much more likely that infection will pass to the people that you live with. And um, you put all this together, and I'm not going to go into these equations in any detail whatsoever, but we get a large complex set of ordinary differential equations that drive the disease dynamics of this system. Um, and I'm just going to sort of delve into one of them just to sort of show you how this works. So this one, if we look at the rate of change of susceptibles of age A, um, this is influenced by obviously the proportion of people still susceptible and the force of infection into that category, which is determined by, say, the first infected in the household, secondary detected, secondary undetected, as you see with the superscripts, and any individuals who are in quarantine. So. That's a very brief sort of two and two minute overview of how the model works. But obviously, there's a lot more complexity behind this and really happy to talk about it. Anyone that's interested now, as I said, this has been used for a number of things. Um, and um, we are one of the groups that feeds into the sort of weekly R estimates. And we've used the model for short and medium term projections and also some longer term scenarios, such as kind of reasonable worst case scenarios that we did last year to look at kind of support the NHS for winter planning and also the rollout of the vaccination campaign. But one of the things relevant to something I'm going to talk about today actually is circuit breakers. So many of you may remember in the UK last year, just around, well, slightly before this time last year, there was a big controversy in the media over the need to put in some kind of lockdown, the need for some kind of preemptive control because of the fear that the NHS was going to be overwhelmed. And there was a lot of work done around this time on the idea of a circuit breaker lockdown. So the idea here is it's a short term planned lockdown. If it's planned in advance, it should, and I emphasize should, have a less severe effect on the economy. But of course, it doesn't fix everything. Uh, and we were looking at this around about September, October time last year. Now, there's some very, very simple maths underlying this idea. Um, and, you know, the, Essentially, what we can think about is when a disease is prevalent in the population, effectively, you've got exponential growth. Um, and at the time we were looking at this, we were thinking about a circuit breaker lockdown around the school half term period in England. 
Um, and the idea here is sort of before the half term, you can see that cases are exponentially growing with some rate. And then if you put a circuit breaker in, the idea is if you can drive the R number below one, hopefully you can go into an, an exponential decay phase and everything starts to move down again. But of course, as I said, it doesn't fix everything. As soon as you sort of pull the plug, as it were, the R number becomes greater than one and you get exponential growth again. Um, and sort of the amount of time that you buy from this circuit breaker is really dependent upon how much the epidemic is growing before the circuit breaker and how much the epidemic decays during the circuit breaker. Um, and so this is sort of given by this kind of schematic that you see here. OK, so we used our model to um, to look at this really and sort of determined well based upon um, how much we could get the um, the epidemic to decay during the circuit breaker, how many days we would sort of buy ourselves, or if you like, you can think, well, you know, how much do you wind the clock back by in terms of the number of in terms of how many cases you were reporting at that point in time? Um, and, you know, I mean, this is kind of very common sense results. It's driven by the growth rate prior to the circuit breaker, as you can see on the x axis here. Um, and of course, the intensity of the circuit breaker, as you can see by the different colours, that really drives how much time you buy yourself. Um, and this just shows you some sort of simulation results here um, that um, obviously the as you go from the, um, the black line here, the black dashed line down to the gold line, this corresponds to more intensive circuit breaker lockdowns. And you can see that everything kind of drops down in infections, in hospitalizations and in deaths. But of course, then goes back up again. And in this particular result, you can see that things have got so severe in cases as you get into late December that we have to do another circuit breaker. So it's, as I said, it doesn't fix everything, but it can buy you time. OK, so um, that's really the setup here. But in a lot of the work that we've presented thus far, a lot of the work we've done for SPY-M, we've really analysed policies really focused on direct losses from COVID, be it cases, be it hospital emissions, be it deaths. Um, but we do acknowledge it's really important that we consider not only direct losses from COVID, but also economic losses as a result of lockdown. And of course, there are other aspects of well-being and mental health and personal losses that I'm not going to go into here in this talk, but of course are extremely important. So, as I said right at the start, this is very much scratching the surface of this problem. And when we started to think about this, we thought, well, can we come up with a relatively simple, understandable metric that we can use to be a sort of a measure of economic harm and then build that into our model? So we, we started thinking about um, gross domestic product. So could we fit a model to monthly GDP using our parameter for sort of intensity of control and see how control is influencing GDP over time? Um, and here you just see um, a sort of a bar chart of the monthly GDP in the UK. Um, and we fit a polynomial essentially to that GDP over time and how that changes during the course of the year, where the sort of the, fun, the parameter here is our intensity of control phi. Um, now, you'll notice there's two lines on here, and there will be people on this call that will have much greater expertise than I will on this, but you can see that right around about the first lockdown, there was a big drop in GDP, um, possibly potentially as a shock um, sort of reaction to um basically everything shutting down and so when we fit our function we do this both fitting to the entirety of the year but also fitting only from june onwards once we feel that the shock that initial shock has been absorbed basically so you'll see a, a red line considering the whole of 2020 and a blue line only fitting from june 2020 onwards and what we're going to do is we're going to look at optimizing lockdown policies based upon a given willingness to pay how much money are you willing to spend basically per quality adjusted life year loss avoided um, and what we're looking to minimize is this willingness to pay times the quality loss plus the loss to gdp so that gives us a measure of trying to combine health and economic losses so what we're going to do now is we're going to use this model to carry out a series of simulations where we vary the timing, the frequency and the intensity of circuit breaker lockdowns to try to determine what an optimal policy is when we are optimizing this, um, this 
sort of metric. And based upon a given willingness to pay, we can see what the optimal strategy would be. Um, now, we are also going to look at a threshold on hospital occupancy. Now, this is very important because, of course, it may be that with this, with this function, it may be the optimal policy that comes out at the end might have an unreasonable pressure on hospitals. And so what we do is we say, well, OK, we also need to consider that actually we don't want hospital occupancy to exceed a certain threshold in order to protect the NHS. So we're going to we're going to do some of that as well. OK, so. Um, Let's so start looking at this. So in, initially, what we did is we looked at, well, um, taking a willingness to pay of £30,000 per quality, which is probably roughly of the order of what's considered reasonable for sort of a pharmaceutical intervention um, in the NHS. Um, and what we looked at is we looked at a different level of control sort of outside the circuit breaker, which you can see on the X axis in all of these graphs and then varied the levels of control inside the circuit breaker, which you can see by all the vertical dots that go up and down on each one of these points. Um, and then we can determine what, for each of these different scenarios, what the total quality loss would be on the top, what the total GDP loss would be, and the net monetary loss where we combine these functions together. Um, and if we tie all of this in, we can see that we can get an optimal policy on the bottom, which tells us this is what the optimal policy should be in terms of the circuit breakers, which are the black bars above these lines. Um, and it tells us what are hospitalizations in light colors or deaths in darker colors would be at this, um, at this economic optimum, as it were. Um, so um, this just gives you an idea of sort of what we expect here. Now, um, see on the left, we're fitting to the whole of 2020 and on the right, we're fitting to June onwards, just to sort of put that into perspective. Um, so our little dots that we have here tell us where the um, economic optimum is that minimizes this overall loss. Now, if we increase our willingness to pay, so if we're prepared to spend more money, then I know there's a lot to take in here, but really there's one message I want to get across from looking at these graphs alongside each other, which is that the optimal level of control moves to the right and moves down, which effectively means if you're willing to spend more money, you're going to recommend a more severe lockdown. And of course, you're going to have fewer hospitalizations and deaths as a result of that. So it's very common sense, but of course, it's a very easy way to say, well, actually, how much does is how much you're willing to spend influence what an optimal policy might be. Um, so if we put all of this together, then we can determine what might be the optimal level of control outside the circuit breaker, what might be the optimal level of control inside the circuit breaker, and the dates for the first and second circuit breakers as a function of willingness to pay. Um, and the different colored lines here correspond to different thresholds on hospital occupancy. So the blue line, the dark blue line imposes no threshold. The purple line is 20,000 hospital on hospitalizations and the uh, 20,000 people in hospital and the light blue line is 10,000 individuals in hospital. So again, if you have no limit on hospitalizations, you're going to uh, recommend much less severe controls. And of course, as your willingness to pay goes up, your threshold, uh, your control levels also go up. OK, so given this, for a given value of W, we can therefore establish what the optimal timing and intensity of these lockdowns should be. Um, and we can sum this up in hopefully these relatively simple to understand graphs here. So as you go from the top row to the bottom row, these are different levels of willingness to pay. So as you go to the bottom, you're willing to spend more money. Um, and the background shading corresponds to the intensity of control at any one time. So you can see here the solid bands give you the timings of the lockdown periods and, of course, the intensities of the lockdown periods. Um, and um, this is kind of very common sense as the as the value of W increases, the intensity of control both within and outside the circuit breakers increases at the optimal solution. So. Hopefully, this is a sort of relatively simple way of capturing what we're trying to show in terms of cost here. Um, so we also did a little bit of work to establish the optimal pace of relaxation of the January lockdown based upon a given value of W. 
Um, now, the idea here was, of course, when January came around, we started to roll out vaccination. Um, and we thought, well, okay, um, clearly there was pressure on to start thinking about, well, okay, vaccination's rolling out, it's going very successfully, dependent upon your point of view, um, and we need to start thinking about lifting lockdown. And then there was a big question of how rapidly should we be lifting that lockdown? Now, of course, that's dependent upon how many individuals you can vaccinate, but it's also dependent upon how much money are you willing to spend per quality loss avoided. And again, you can see here as you go from the top to the bottom, higher amount of money you're willing to spend. Um, and unsurprisingly, if you're willing to spend more money, the grey shading here again gives you an idea of the intensity of the lockdown. So it slowly reduces over time. So if you're willing to spend more money, you'll keep the lockdown in for a much longer period of time. And of course, you will get a much smaller resurgence of cases and deaths as you are, as it gives you more time to vaccinate the population. But of course, there's a higher cost associated with that. Okay, so this is very much a whistle stop tour. Um, so I'm probably going to leave it there just to allow some time for questions. So essentially, I think, you know, the key message here, hopefully I'm preaching to the converted here in a sense, but you know, this is we're, this really indicates that the optimal policy is highly dependent upon the willingness to pay per quality loss avoided. This is the big caveat here. Um, this only uses GDP. I mean, I've had discussions with Flavio and others about this as a single metric, and we are very, very aware that in order to do this robustly, we need to consider other factors. And I'm really interested in any discussions about how we might build upon this. And of course, we're not considering health impacts of lockdown. We're only considering direct impacts on of, as a result of COVID in our quality calculations. And this is actually something that I'm planning future work on at the moment to think about long-term impacts of lockdown on particularly child health and um, child sort of educational harms as well. So it's something we're really interested in. So if anyone is interested in discussing this further, very happy to chat about it. But I think in the interest of time, I'll leave that there and I'm quite happy to have some discussion. Thank you, Mike. That was a, a great presentation. Um, yeah, so everyone, please feel free to raise your hands um, and we, we can take some questions or even post in the chat. Um, even any thoughts um, you may have, they don't have to be questions. So here's a question in the chat. So, um, so it's, hi, Mike, have you thought about how many life per day or willingness to pay now, every day, it is sadly almost 200 deaths, death cases per day, if more than 300 a day. Would be another circuit breaker, long COVID indirect costs? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is, uh, I, I will say it's very, very complex. because I think, you know, everyone will have a different idea of what the threshold is, at which point we should reimpose control. And I think this is why it really needs actually properly, robustly calculating what we feel the overall harms are. I mean, it's, yeah. You know, when we talk about qualities, it does almost seem a little bit unpalatable that you're kind of trying to put a cost on extending an individual's life by by a year, for example. Um, but the difficulty we have is when it comes to deaths, it's like, how do you quantify this? And again, really unpalatable. But if we're talking about 200 deaths of, of young people, then clearly, you know, this is this categorically needs action because you could actually put in measures that could give them many, many or more years of quality life by protecting them. And so this is where it's very complicated that we do need to somehow try and quantify not just deaths, but also some kind of metric of overall harms as a result of intervention policies. So I'm not really answering your question because I don't think I can answer your question, but I think it does need much more robustly quantifying across all of these different harms. Thanks, Mike. Um, and there's a question from Alistair. Um, please do unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for that talk so i work in the scottish government um and the so i would suggest looking at our four harms dashboard to look at you know indirect uh, health impacts as well but i think my kind of my main question is really about uh kind of is willingness to pay really you know just going to be a fixed level because kind of my sense at the start of the pandemic is uh kind of coming back to flavio's talk and talk before that, you know, kind of people endogenously change their behavior because of the health risk. So they're willing to accept quite a high 
they've got a high willingness to pay when they don't know what the risk is. It's almost kind of like ambiguity or urgent, something like that. Um, so I, I don't know how you build that into a model, but just, you know, kind of how we've moved now to uh, coming back to the other question, just how, um, what society's threshold is for that tolerance changes over time, depending on the risk to them and the risk to others. So yeah, just kind of any thoughts on that? No, yeah. this is a great point, Alistair. And actually it has been raised before that we shouldn't consider these as static um, willingness to pay. So absolutely, I mean, I welcome more discussion of LX. You're absolutely right that that threshold of willingness to pay may be highly dynamic based upon the current situation. So it's certainly something we should look at trying to build into the next iteration of this model. So yeah, if you have any thoughts, really happy to take this offline and talk more. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. And there's another question in the chat from Christopher Watts. So the quality concept was formed during normal pre-pandemic days. We see dramatic events are happening to lots of people around us. We might adjust quality a very different way now. So I think that's just a comment. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it's not, in a way, it's not our place to say, and this is exactly why, you know, as a as a modeler, really all I can do if we're sort of working on this kind of work and sort of informing government is to present all the data to them and look at different sort of quantifications of these. Um, whether that quality concept is as relevant now as it was pre-pandemic for this current situation, I don't think that's my place to say, but I think we do need to somehow, as I say, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, find a way to quantify all of these harms. I mean, it's kind of one of these things where, you know, if you only care about minimizing the direct impacts of COVID and you put this and you optimize a model like ours, then obviously what comes out the end of, of it is very, very severe lockdown until the end of time. Um, but of course, if we really truly want to optimize, we do need to build in something much more nuanced that builds all of these other things into, into account. So um exactly what form that metric is i think is still open to debate and discussion but we certainly do need to start thinking in those terms particularly over the longer term when we know you know you have policies in place for a long period of time of course there are more associated non-pandemic harms with those which we do need to think about thanks and there's another comment so from ed um another general challenge face quantifying the health impact of long-term chronic conditions resulting from covid given that uncertainty will only lessen as we proceed further in time away from the beginning of the pandemic it's just um, and then a I, challenge there unfortunately yeah. yeah and then there's uh so from pietro um so this is directed to a range of people so even um so let me just get into it. So do you know of any good example in the recent epi or econ, um, epi modeling literature of successful multi-phase, e.g., um, for example, defined by policy intervention or policy announcement date, estimation of behavioral parameters, um, for example, those mod modulating the pre-pandemic baseline contact matrices within a given phase by a standard complex age structured compartmental models calibrated to age stratified surveillance incidence data um, for example asymptomatic cases by date of symptoms onset confirmed cases by date of diagnosis hospital admissions by date of admissions etc so um, i think that's more of a like a literature um based question so maybe if, if you or anyone else has any kind of reply to that please just send the links in the chat, I guess. Um, and then another question, is disability adjusted life years, so dailies, or dailies better, um, better described than um, qualities? Good question. Maybe. Um, and we could certainly look at that. But um, I mean, quality tends to be standard for this kind of work. But um, so, I mean, I'm happy to discuss that Jira, um, offline if you wish. But potentially, you. yes, you could look at it. And then um, I'll take this final question from Maria. So thanks for the great talk. Not a question, but just a comment along the same lines. I think you might get some ethical consequences from this of utilitarian approach, which I like. That wouldn't be very welcomed by some because I think you can buy a quality um, for much cheaper by donating to money, vaccines, etc., to some countries in Africa. Absolutely right. I mean, this is, this is a very, very great point. And I think this exactly comes down to the underlying thing of what ultimately is your objective from this kind of work, but you're completely correct. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you everyone for your questions and thank you, Mike.